Hey, health junkies! It's time for the Health Fix. Join your host, Dr. Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hey, health junkies, Dr. Janine Krause here. A month ago, I started Sarah Banta's Accelerated Detox. I was blown away with how much change I noticed in my body. Now, I'm not talking about weight loss. It wasn't like that. In fact, I felt lighter. I felt like my body was working better, almost like my skin was glowing a little bit more. I felt happier. My thinking was clear, and my gut was working. Maybe a little too much for my liking, but it was working. And if you've listened to any of my previous podcasts, you know that my gut is probably my biggest complaint. Now, I've never seen this much change from a detox before in terms of me feeling better. Usually with a detox, I just feel cleaned out and then I'm left with the feeling of, all right, now what's next? This one, I actually started craving the products and wanted to keep going with them, especially the silver. I don't know what it was about that silver, but it tasted good to the point where I was grabbing the bottle and drinking out of the bottle. What can I say? Very impressive. So I see this detox not as a weight loss program, but a getting your health back on track, kind of like a reset or a booster to your health. Maybe it could be a precursor to starting to address certain health conditions. Nevertheless, I found that this is a great product and I really am going to start supporting it in my practice. And today we're going to be talking all about the intricacies of Sarah's products in this detox and how some of my patients who also tried it out with me fared. So stay tuned. Let's jump into the discussion. Hello there, health junkies. You have a Big special treat today. I have Dr. Chris Miletus on the line with me today. He is a naturopathic doctor who has extensive experience with food sensitivity testing. And since I like to talk all about food and how it affects our body, I thought what a great person to have on. So Dr. Chris, say hello. Hey, hello, hello everyone. Well, thanks for coming on. I definitely want to jump in and start talking about food sensitivity. When was the first time in your naturopathic career you started thinking about testing for food sensitivity? Probably 1991. Um, so I graduated in 92, but I realized even as a student clinician at the Naturopathic University down here in Portland, Oregon, that a lot of patients are coming in, they seem like they were exacerbated. They had worsening of their symptoms with certain dietary intakes. And so I think that's when I first started thinking about it. Plus, honestly, I started thinking about it because I spent two years from college to go enter a naturopathic school on the third world island called Dominica, not Dominican Republic. And I ended up with gut issues. So then all of a sudden, food became really, you know, kind of important to me because if I ate the wrong food, I ended up feeding the critters, which I had collected down in the Caribbean. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, there's a link here. And I think you and I and most of the audience knows it was Hippocrates 400 BCE that said, may your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. And I think then it was a Roman that spoke to the wrong food for the wrong person wasn't a good thing. So I, I think it just came to fruition. So I started doing testing and I realized that if I can identify the cause of a problem, then I've eliminated it. So we, on naturopathic medicine, often speak about the obstacle to the cure, and that was the case with Mr. Harley. Uh, Mr. Harley was a, one of my first patients, and I was 26 years old, wet behind the ears, <laughs> uh, full head of hair, and he was 77 years old. And he's, he said, Chris, I have many years. And I, I gotta look up many years. I knew what it was. but And he, he said, I still enjoy downhill skiing. Good for him. 77 years old, downhill skiing. But he, his style was being crimped because whenever he'd go eat with his friends and family at a restaurant, more often than not, he, the room would start spinning, very classical many years. And we did a food sensitivity test on him, found out it was dairy and wheat. That was his problem. And lo and behold, he says, son, says, yes, Mr. Hurley, uh, I grew up on a farm. I've always had dairy. I've always had wheat. Why would this be a problem? He says, humor me. If not, I'll eat my hat and I didn't have a hat but I'd have to go buy a hat to eat and he would adhere to my recommendation of avoiding 
the dairy and the wheat. I did add a little ginkgo, um, quercetin, which helps with often food sensitivities and other kinds of allergies. And lo and behold, he started downhill, downhill skiing and um, enjoyed his life. Wow. That's pretty impressive because I think there's a lot of people out there that have Meniere's and have no idea that there is a food sensitivity connection. Yeah, anything that causes that inner ear um, pressure or fluidity to change is you got to wonder, like, well, if I eat the wrong food, my ankles swell. If I eat the wrong food, I feel puffy or bloated. Well, couldn't that happen in your inner ear or middle ear? Well, yeah, it could happen any place. And so it's all about the spine little hairs and many people, or maybe may not, know that our inner ear is like a little gyroscope. It's got a little conch shell in there and has a left and a right and it has these little hairs and fluidity and crystals and it just gets off a little bit and it literally spins our world. <laughs> yes, literally turns it upside down in, in a lot of cases. What about your, your thoughts in terms of connections to benign positional vertigo? So BPPV, I think I missed a letter in there in terms of my description, but that one. Yes, I think there's no question. Um, I, I, our sense of balance is I'm sitting here in front of a computer, visual, and even with my glasses, nearly blind. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, that's one of my um, cues and clues to my position. Proprioception. You know, if you're sitting or you're standing as you're listening to this or driving, you're not really thinking about it. Am I listening to the left or am I listening to the right? Am I swaying forward? Am I swaying back? This is all subconscious. This is all happening through a process that you and I know is proprioception. And so we've got that. We've got then our inner ear along with our visual. And all of these things work. So when we get to the benign positional component of things, it also plays a role. But also what plays a role is the vagal nerve. Mm-hmm. And you were going to say the vagal nerve. I can say Vegas. They were going to say, ooh, we're going to Vegas. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the vagal nerve. It's also known as the vagus nerve. Yes. And with a V-A-G-U-S and it had nothing to do with lost wages. It's not, that's, so that's what airlines will say as you're landing. Welcome to lost wages. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I find a direct correlation. But I wrote an article on the vagal nerve because a Ph.D. researcher was telling me about his positional vertigo. And he says, I notice if I eat the wrong food, food sensitivity, or anything that just didn't digest well for him, he'd get a little bloated or a little distended. Mm-hmm. And then he would have dizziness, heart palpitations, and the condition is called a Roma Health Syndrome. And I can send you a, the article, and if you want to post it for your listeners, you can. And it's, it's I wrote it in the Towns Letter on the vagus nerve. And so what's interesting, you go to the eye doctor, I was mentioning my visual challenges, and he or she will say, go ahead and don't move your head and follow the pen or follow my finger, right? And you and I know they're measuring one of the 12 cranial nerves. In that case, they're measuring three or four of the cranial nerves. Then they flash a light in your eye. And so these little cranial nerves from our brain are absolutely totally critical to how well we're doing. But the vagal nerve is also known as the vagabond nerve. Because it wanders throughout your GI tract, past your heart, down your esophagus, and down into your intestinal tract. But 80% of it's sensory, which is unusual for a nerve, and only 20% is motor or action oriented. But now it's going directly up to your brain again and saying, I'm not happy. And some of us have had food poisoning. We vomited before we get the diarrhea. And we've sat on the <laughs> commode and we're just like, I think I'm going to die here. I feel, right. I feel sweaty. I feel clammy. Oh my goodness, this is the big one. Well, that's the vagal nerve. It's called, of course, you and I know it as a vasosyncope and or the vasovagal effect. And But now your digestive tract can do that too, which ties into food sensitivities in a very big way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, like you're saying, with all of that sensory activity, I think a lot of people forget that your gut's constantly checking in with your brain. It's constantly going, do I feel good? Is there any stretching going on? What's happening? It's like a constant communication. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and once again, anybody's ever had the flu, it's like, okay, you want to pull the covers over your head and say, I hope this passes. I don't think I can live another day this way. And you know how it affects your brain. And you and I in our practices work on the gut-brain connection all the time. Unhappy tummy, unhappy brain. You know, it's like, I'm really in a great mood. Well, my tummy feels bad. Yeah, those two conversations don't come together. <laughs> it's true. It's true. 
So let's talk a little bit about, so someone's got the Vegas nerve, and I always make the joke of what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas because, well, <laughs> you know, we get, we get reactions. And sometimes when people come back from Las Vegas, it seems that the Vegas nerve goes cuckoo, um, and we do have all of the gut issues coming out. But let's talk for a minute a little bit about how, you know, uh, the food sensitivity testing works compared to someone doing a food elimination diet. Because I've got a lot of pe- people who are like, well, why would I do food sensitivity testing? I could just do elimination testing. Speak to that a little bit for the crew. Uh, excellent. Well, we all know the gold standard in medicine of determining whether a food is a problem or not is the elimination challenge. But a true elimination challenge is you're going down to one or two foods, let's say rice and chicken or some combination to keep you alive while to survive the elimination challenge. And then you do that for a period of time and then you introduce one food at a time. And so it takes a level of discipline and heroics, which is very complex. And we know that there's many types of sensitivities. And so if we eat a food, any of us, like if I eat hazelnuts, my mouth will get itchy. But I also have a birch tree allergy. And so birch trees and food sensitivities with hazelnuts are well known. Same thing with apples and carrots. So then all of a sudden this person with elimination challenge diet is like, okay, are you doing it during the right season for you to do it? Because if it's a birch season, you're going to be cross-reacting to all kinds of things which aren't truly sensitivities, but they're cross-reactivities with the outside world because during birch season, which is one of my nemesis, seems like <laughs> it's all going to be my vision, equilibrium. No, it's not really though. Um, but birch trees cross-react with carrots, celery, tofu, soy, um, tree nuts, as well as apples and a litany of other fruits and veggies. And so if I'm doing an elimination challenge during a high pollen count for myself, I'm not going to get an honest answer. Mm -hmm. And so I use a a food sensitivity test like IGG from like U.S. Biotech uh, laboratory that I educate for. And I use that to for one particular reason, it gives me 196 or 144 food list of things my immune system is saying, hey, I'm going to take some of the guesswork out even before you do the elimination challenge. Take these foods out of the picture because they're, immunologically there are things you're responding to. So it helps speed up the elimination challenge if you're going to do it that way. But it also gives you a menu in the buffet of life. So I enjoy eating at salad bars. Uh, in fact, people are saying, well, aren't you going to add any bread? No, I'm good with my very large, healthy stuff, and <laughs> minus, minus the dirty dozen foods, which is a whole other conversation. And <laughs> and it's like, hmm, well, now if I knew not to put the chickpeas on or the baked beans on or the corn on my salad because I go to big, long salad bars, and it's like, hmm, I mean, I would have felt better and done better to my body if I had just avoided the thing I really didn't like eating, but I thought it was good for me. Answer is yes. So I use this as a tool in the buffet of life. Choose to be bad when you're going to be bad, knowing you're going to pay a price in terms of miserable or bowels or irritation or headache or migraine or whatever. And, but at the same time, it just gives you a nice tool. It gives you that menu of, okay, friend or foe. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That's a great explanation. So I think a lot of people – are seeing different things online in terms of elimination diet and thinking, oh, this isn't so hard. But as someone who's tried it myself, oh gosh, I can't tell you how many times and had to quit because I was down to, like you said, chicken and rice. Yep. Um, And then I eventually ended up with a sensitivity to rice. (laughs) So that's a whole nother story. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, it just becomes really complicated. And so going towards food sensitivity takes a uh, a testing takes a little bit of the work out of it. Now, here's another question I get from folks. Validity of food sensitivity testing, because the the number one thing, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, people come in and they're like, yeah, but it's going to tell me everything I eat. And so I'm going to have a reaction to everything I eat. How do you answer that question? Um, Only partially true. Um, there's two types of sensitivities. So, of course, I think for the audience, we're going to clarify. There's food sensitivities and food allergies. Food allergies are IgE-mediated, and think of E for emergency room. There's the hives. There's the asthma. There's the you know whole milieu of instant thing. Like you get stung by a bee, you can have an anaphylactic reaction. So we're not talking about IgE. So I'm going to take that off the table and that's a whole nother conversation of true overt allergies. Food intolerances or sensitivities are 
can be IgG, IgG4, or IgA driven. But let's talk about IgG. That's the most prevalent one in the marketplace, even though U.S. Biotech offers all of them through a, a finger stick test, a blood spot test. And so we go ahead and we look at IgG. There's two, when you look at the report, you're going to see two things, earned reactivities or sensitivities and fixed sensitivities. For example, once, once again, back to myself, I had a high reaction to lobster. I've never knowingly eaten, even with butter, lobster. It's just not my thing. I'm not a bottom feeder eater. I call them the rats of the ocean. And for those that enjoy them, great. You can have mine too. <laughs> and so, but what, what would cause me to have a lobster score? Well, clearly I've never eaten it. So, well, that actually picked up something that I would never have known if I had not done that test because it was not falling in that category. Well, of course, it's going to show everything I've eaten. Now, mind you, I eat dairy. I eat eggs. And so did those show up? Yes. And so, but now imagine if you've been one of those people, I say, yeah, I don't feel good on dairy. And so you've been eliminating dairy. Once again, that whole elimination child. You've just been avoiding dairy for three months, six months, and you measure yourself and you're still elevated. You're saying, well, why am I still elevated on a food I've been avoiding? Well, that's because there is a fixed component and you just in the past exacerbated that score because you've been hammering on something that was already your weak knee, so to speak, where your proverbial Achilles heel. So, but lots of times you'll have a person that's eating a wide variety of foods and lots of them aren't showing up. So that kind of deflates that concept of everything I eat is going to show up. Now the foods you're eating that are problematic will show up because that's called the earned sensitivity. <laughs> but then there's going to be those fixed ones where like never ate that food. Don't like that food. I, for, I ate it as a kid. I didn't care for it. But well, that's the fixed one. So the food sensitivity test will identify earned, aka you've already ate it. So that concept's true. So that hypothesis is going to show things I've eaten or daily overeaten. But remember, an IgG score can last up to 72 hours. So let's say I have eggs today. And then tomorrow I have quiche, which I believe has egg in it. And then I have <laughs> a naughty French toast with heavily dipped in an egg. Well, I've got a reaction for the first day of my omelet for 72 hours. Then the next day I have a reaction for 72 hours. So I still get my first reaction. I'm still going for 72 hours because I'm only 24 hours later. I've created a whole nother reaction to egg. And then I've created a whole nother reaction to egg. And this is a concept many of you have heard called the rotation diet. That you play choo-choo train and not my pyramid stacking up the stairs of reactivity so that you're basically going deeper and deeper into the fog bank. And I give that example because a lot of times you get brain fog when you have a lot of sensitivities or your joints will hurt more because it's a stacking effect in living in Oregon and enjoying the Oregon coast, I describe walking along the seashore with my new pair of shoes and all the waves, the, the tide's pretty mellow, but every once in a while the waves creep up and slosh up onto the seashore much further than the traditional shoreline because little waves stack and become big waves. The same thing with these little scores. It's a straw on the camel's back. They burden you to the point that eventually you hit the threshold and you're wondering, what, what did I eat three days ago to be honest with you, I can't remember why I ate yesterday in totality with accuracy. So how am I going to determine why I'm feeling crummy? And it was actually on Tuesday, and Tuesday's indiscretions, unbeknownst to me, that causes me to feel muddled today. So analytical testing, the test from U.S. Biotech, does uh, every test is ran in duplicate with known controls, negative and positive. So there's reproducibility, and you want to have a laboratory that's both CLIA and COLA accredited, and there's very few, and U.S. Biotech is the only one I know that has both accreditations. That's pretty impressive. Yep, that is, that, you know, for a lot of people, I think, you know, understanding that these tests aren't just <sighs> hogwash, maybe, <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of people out there like, well, I could get food sensitivity testing, but it's not that accurate. I'm like, well, who told you it wasn't that accurate? And nobody out there can really give me a clear answer as to why they don't think it's very accurate, but you know, to get a CLIA certification in the first place is a big deal. And then COLA on top of it, explain how that is a really big deal. Well, it's a whole nother level of accreditation. So imagine you file your taxes and this has nothing to do with taxes, but might as well create some stress for all of us. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, so you file your taxes and your accountant says, you've done a really good job of filling out all the forms. And okay. Well, imagine that's like CLIA. CLIA actually certifies all the major laboratories. 
but now you get a whole nother person to audit your charts or audit your taxes and you go ahead and go like, hey, you did a phenomenal job. And in the case of US biotech, they've actually been given accommodation for how phenomenal they do. And what's amazing is US biotech actually is so cutting edge that most of their machinery upstairs in the second story of their laboratory are robotic. But yes, there's humans there and no, it's not a spaceship, but it, you kind of get a feeling it could be a spaceship because everything's being micro pipetted with robotics, taking out human error. And so they have three PhDs on staff. They have three engineers on staff. They have a 3D printer to make parts for their machine, their multi gazillion dollar machines that get, if they break down, fixed. And so that reproducibility is what allowed them to both get CLIA and COLA accreditation. But to know that your sample is being ran twice, so that's good. Reproducibility is like, hey, you made some really good chocolate chip cookies. Can you do it again? <laughs> and, and do that yeah, do that for thousands of times per day. So that's why they have this accreditation. Um, but in addition to this, we're also looking for how at a microscopic level is the accuracy in terms of analytics. So not only are the tests ran in parallel and via barcode, so they're blinded through the, the process, they also are measured with known positive and negative controls, which means, yeah, I know what the best chocolate chip cookie is. I know what the wrong chocolate chip cookie is. And we're going to have those as the standards for your cookie. And, and so once again, all those levels of redundancy and to spend the time and allocation to run known positive and negative controls with your own blood says, hey, you better be positive of that. If so, otherwise, something's wrong. Or you better not be positive of that because something's wrong. It's just the level of, you know, this is how I chose them. It's because they just have that level of redundancy and I'll term it retentiveness with love and affection, but retentiveness. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I mean, that's kind of what we, what we want in this profession is things to be the most accurate, but also for patients to not waste anybody's time. I believe you quoted that the most expensive test is the one you didn't get data you wanted from. So <laughs> yes. you want data and you want the data to be the best that you can get. And I'm a very big data geek in that case. So one of the things that I get asked a lot about just food sensitivity testing in general is, is the agglutination style testing better than a white blood cell type of testing? So what is U.S. biotech doing in that department? Is it agglutination style or is it white blood cell? Uh, so there's a lot of different tests out there. And I've been very fortunate and blessed to have written 16 books. And one of the books I wrote was all called The Liberation from Allergies. And I will say there is no perfect test. Mm -hmm. Every test offers some unique spin on things. So the testing that's done by U.S. Biotech is using raw food protein antigens. I give the example of a barcode on one of my supplement bottles here. If I go ahead and scan it with like at the scanner at the store and the scanner at the store represents your immune system and the barcode represents the protein antigen saying, I am milk, I am egg, I'm a goose, I'm a whatever the food is. Then you say, okay, do I get along with it or not? And I, and so they put in little acrylic wells. It's way back in the day when I first started, it was modified HIV ELISA technology. So let's get high tech technology being used now for another application. And you saw the level of reactivity. So they're using raw foods. So you have the protein additives. Because we know when we cook things, we digest them differently. Mm -hmm. So this is raw foods uh, with uh, uh, intact amino acids. Because if you actually cook something, you can denature the protein. And therefore, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't react the same. So you've got the protein you got your immune system, and it's a HIV, modified HIV, ELISA technology, which you're using. Now, there are some laboratories that use white blood cells. They'll say, here's your white blood cell in totality. I can take it from your bloodstream. Here's your white blood cells. How do you get along? Well, hopefully, there's not a whole lot of food particles floating around in the bloodstream. You can make an argument, well, that's not exactly the way the test works. But if you think about our immune system and how the antigens work. You want to look for that reproducibility. I will tell you, my mentor used a very similar kind of white blood cell technology way back in 92. 
He had practiced for 41 years, and that technology has been around for a very long time in various persuasions. And so it's like, okay, there's all these different ways to do it, but then it comes down to reproducibility and also price point and ease. This can be done with a simple finger prick test, the IgG, IgA, or IgG4 food sensitivities, and it's really quite affordable, let alone when it's ran a duplicate and you have a CLIA and a COLA accredited uh, and certified lab. Okay. Thanks for kind of clarifying that a little bit. I would like to know something, and it just came across my head just as you were saying it. You were saying the difference between, you know, raw foods and cooked foods in terms of digestibility, which hands down cooked foods are going to be easier to digest. Would it be interesting if there was a food sensitivity testing assay that not only did raw food but cooked food? Would that make a difference? Just throwing it out there in terms of a random thought. Yeah, I mean – by doing it raw, you're getting the highest level of reactivity and just knowing that you're setting the bar to the highest level of probability of a problem. And the more you cook it, you know, obviously you're denaturing enzymes. I have a saying for that I actually restate several times in various books of mine, live food for living people, dead food for dying people. And I'm sure you and I educate our patients that shop on the outside of the grocery store the produce section and other sections, not the, what I call the canned foods, the ones <laughs> that are in cans and boxes and, you know, the processed stuff because food is not meant to be preserved. And I don't mean that from a ethereal perspective. It's great that we have the ability to preserve foods. But if you go through an orchard, the, orchard, the apples rot themselves because they have the enzymes to digest themselves. Um, sadly enough, roadkill has the ability to digest itself too. Because there's live enzymes. But the moment we denature those, we actually make the digestive process that much harder. So I'm actually, the less, you know, that's why we tell our patients, you might want to steam that broccoli as opposed to boiling that broccoli. Because we lose nutrients as a result of that. And as well as, we're now having to do all the digestion ourselves because the enzymes aren't there. That's my thought. But what's your thought? Well, no, I, I kind of agree. Just lightly cooked, not completely nursing home status in terms of <laughs> foods. No offense to nursing homes. I bet there's some great ones out there with great food. But in my experience, <laughs> it's uh, dead. Yeah, it's like lifeless. No food. I mean, it's all mush and there's no flavor to it, much like roadkill after it's been out for a little bit or, or even an apple that's been out for a while. So, okay, I get it then. So raw food protein is going to have the highest level of reactivity because it's the most alive food. So that's why we test the raw food. Got yes. it. Cool. That helps me to understand a lot because I think with, with food sensitivity testing and how it's kind of rolled out to us in natural school and, and what we do in terms of our own research, it's one of these like, yep, do that be, when someone has X, Y, or Z. And beyond that, we're not really you know diving into the intricacies of it. So I like this. This is good. So now, my next question in terms of naturopathic medicine confusion in my world, or maybe it's just my brain. We can call it Janine's brain. Well, I think it's all of our brains, I'm sure, because knowing you and knowing how smart you are and you're a thinker, any of us that are constantly thinking, like we come across these things, okay, I wonder if everybody else is thinking this. Well, the answer is no, but <laughs> those of us that are thinking it, but go ahead. Oh, good. Well... I don't know. My brain is always going. Thank goodness I can sleep now. But IgG versus Ig4, how does that make, you know, tell me tell me the difference between those two because I'm very intrigued about the Ig4 and I think I just don't completely understand how it works. Uh, great. And actually, if, if any of the audience wants to go to usbiotech.com, I have a presentation on IgG4. IgG4 is intriguing and so I graduated in 1992, and if I wasn't an educator, if I didn't go around the country lecturing to hundreds and sometimes a thousand plus doctors, I would probably not have learned as much as I have and kept up as much as I have. But what you always want to have for a provider is somebody like Dr. Krauss, which is always thinking and learning and always inquiring. Because otherwise you have old knowledge and your body and your and the science is constantly changing. So the answer to the question is IgG has four major subclasses. So think four pieces of the pie. And the first three pieces of the pie, IgG 1, 2, and 3, are pro-inflammatory, contribute to the immunological allergy cascade in a very significant fashion. 
because they are activators of a fancy substance called complement, which gets this biochemical cascade going. IgG4 is often referred to in the medical literature as a blocking antibody. And so as a result, it can be elevated in conditions such as eosinophilic esophagitis, mm. inflammatory bowel disease, autism spectrum, then, as well as for other kinds of symptoms like that. So there are this little subgroup of things that the medical literature says, you might want to measure IgG4 as well because you might capture some other things, but back to the blocking component because it does not activate complement. So it's actually, if you were to think about driving with two feet, which I don't believe is legal, but maybe it is, but you have <laughs> one foot on the accelerator, well, that'd be the IgG1, 2, and 3, and your left foot's on the brake, that's our IgG4. It's, once again, the innate wisdom of the body to hold the body in balance and to confer a degree of protection. They have an analogy, which is actually on my presentation at usbiotech.com, about beekeepers. Beekeepers, over the course of time, often become somewhat immune to being stung. And they believe that part of that immunity or tolerance is actually due to the fact that they have cranked up their IgG4. Say, I will cope with that. I'm not thrilled about it. It's much like being bit by a snake. Well, I have antivenom. Yeah, I'd rather not be bit. I'd rather not be stung. But So the concept here is, if you do IgG with IgG4, then you get a sense of some immunological balance and how much has your body worked to try to become kumbaya with a problem. <laughs> so the problem, but we're going to contain the bar fight over here in the corner and not disrupt the rest of the patrons. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the bar fight came from, but it just popped in my head, so there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all have a wild side. Things come out of nowhere. It might be a Freudian slip. You never know. Well, I hope not. <laughs> But this this component of like how hard are you fighting to keep something in check or how hard are you fighting to manage a particular allergen, if you will, that's interesting because I'm only aware of only one other company that does that and I just find it I just find it interesting. And I think it's it's great to have all of the aspects in terms of the components of what brings to the table in terms of food sensitivity testing. So now we've got IgE, which is E for emergency, IgG, which is your delayed sensitivity. Then we've got the IgG4, which is kind of how hard are we trying to contain a bar fight? I kind of like that. That's a good analogy. <laughs> and then I, IgA. Uh, how do you IgA. explain IgA to folks? Well, certainly. And for those, you mentioned IgG is delayed, or you think of G for gradual. So oh. that's how and that's how my patients say, oh, oh gradual. So so E for emergency room, G for gradual. Uh, not nice. obviously not what they meant, but that's what they really reflect in the body. IgA, I think mucous membrane. So as we all sit here chatting and listening, we know that we have IgA in our body. In fact, IgA is critical. It's like waterproof in your body from foreign invaders. It's like Scotch guarding a couch for going all the health hazards of Scotch guarding um, furniture and sitting on the toxins. That's a whole nother conversation for another <laughs> day. But the concept of waterproofing or making a physical barrier between us and them, and them being microbes or allergens, our eyes, our nose, our throat, our lungs, GI tract, and female reproductive areas are all what we call, call soft, mushy tissues. They're moist and they're not tough like the outside of our skin. They're not keratinized. And keratin is what allows our outside of our skin to be able to be exposed to things. Well, well, IgA coats all of those in the form of secretory IgA. Our body secretes it with intention to say, no, there's a physical barrier here, the waterproofing, to keep it out. And so if someone sneezes and you have good secretory IgA, you're less likely, all things being equal, to become ill or as ill and once again, we know that when we get stress, our IgA levels drop precipitously. And this is where you're going to stress yourself out. You're going to get sick. We've all heard it or we've all experienced it. But IgA, from an immunological perspective, can pick up foods that have are actually physically irritating, let's say, our intestinal tract. Ooh. But we see this particularly common with people with IBS, Crohn's disease and colitis, ulcerative colitis, those are known as an inflammatory bowel disease. So IBD versus IBS. 
and or other mechanical irritants. So it's great for people with mucous membrane issues, which we were describing, eyes, nose, throat, GI tract. And it also casts the net wider. If a person could afford to do all the tests, and U.S. Biotech is by far the most affordable that I'm aware of. But, you know, once again, shopping around is important. And this is not a sales pitch for U.S. Biotech by any stretch. I'm an independent educator for them. I just happen to use them for the last 25 years of my clinical practice. And only the last little bit have I become an educator for them. So what I would say is if you could do all of them, I would do all of them. IgA, IgG, IgG4. Lots of people ask, well, Chris, if you can only do one, which one would you do? And my answer for my patients is IgG. Yeah. It casts a net pretty wide. It won't capture everything, and then I will then target and add on either an IgA or an IgG4 in addition to it. And if I have a choice, if it's bowel-oriented or mucous membrane-oriented, I'll do IgG, IgA. Or if I know they've gotten allergy shots over the course of time and we want to know how successful they are, or the, you've done some other desensitization program, you want to know, have I gotten that left foot firmly on the brake to slow down some of that reactivity? You can do that, and there's quite a bit of medical literature. I'm sure your audience is quite familiar with a website called PubMed, mm -hmm. P-U-B-M-E-D dot gov. You can type in IgG4, and you can actually come up with medical literature. But when you go to PubMed, it is not for the faint of heart. It is not <laughs> a Google-friendly site. It is medical. It is no... Bedside manner, you will you will have a panic attack the moment you look at IgG4 because the first thing that will pop up are all kinds of IgG4 diseases described by analytical types with no sense of bedside manner. But if you do <laughs> IgG4 food sensitivities, it gets a little bit better. <laughs> but I, I can tell you one of the biggest problems my patients have, and we all know this from having been medical students, is called medical school syndrome where you've you just read about something in class, you heard about it from your professor, and then all of a sudden, you go, I think I might have that disease. <laughs> and now just because you have a couple of those symptoms does not mean you have that disease. But so I say over half of my patients suffer from a very, very endemic and epidemic. It's called Googleitis. Yeah. The more you Google, the more inflamed your sense of well-being is. <laughs> so true. I think I have a podcast dedicated to how to effectively Google well, usually I call it GTS that, um, yes. and uh, without breaking your brain, uh, because yeah, PubMed would be a whole nother level of uh, breaking your brain and creating probably some brain damage if you get oh, yeah. into that. That, that, one, that one sentence in the whole article will be your <laughs> takeaway. Like that had nothing to do with anything. That was a passing comment, but because it's, they're very yeah, it's just once again, it's like listening to a conversation with jumping in the middle of let's say a. Uh, uh, analyst on the economy and yeah things are looking very bad for the next quarter looks like there's going to be epic changes like oh, oh my goodness and they were talking about some microscopic components like but all i heard is epic changes oh my goodness hide hide <laughs> so <laughs> yes epic changes imminent death and gosh you know i don't know it, yeah. it could be crazy so those of you out here there who are my patients who are listening to this podcast just print off whatever you read and bring it to me We'll, yes. we'll discuss. Good, good advice. Good advice. <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of it like you know I love to do. So let's talk a little bit more about, say someone gets their food sensitivity results, and they're looking through the results, and they're like, I have 4,000 milds, I have like five moderates, and I have like two severes. Are all those milds? really necessary? Do I have to avoid all of them? What do I do? How do I, how do I manage this? Uh, great question. And this is a saying that I know that both you and I are here to treat the patient, not the lab. Mm -hmm. The lab is a tool. And if you had a shovel in your um, shed and the last time you used a shovel, you chopped off a toe, you probably wouldn't use that shovel again. <laughs> It'd be the, the bad shovel. <laughs> and or maybe you were just uncoordinated, but that's a whole other story about shovels. But so what we want to do is when there's high scores, you know, let's say the threes and fours, we, we're going to try to eliminate those and see how does that improve the picture for you. So you eliminate the high, high scores for a good month or longer and just say, okay, that's a, a definitive 
point of time where we're going to actually, you know, say I'm going to eliminate those. But then the middle foods, unless you know there's a food in that middle that you just told every time you eat it, you'll feel crummy. Then you say, well, count that one high because I'm not going to eat that one. Like, to heck no. But then I say this is where you play that what I will term choo-choo train. Instead of stacking them like stacking blocks, we're going to say, well, once every week or once every four days – but what I usually try people have people do is I have them try to clean up their diet with the highs and the moderately highs and see how good is good. Because lots of times people don't know how good good is because all they've known is kind of crummy. And I'll give a silly example. When my children, which are now 21 and 25, when my oldest was about maybe 11 years old, we were in San Diego. We were doing a little harbor tour and there were all these battleships. We've never been to San Diego. Lots of battleships. <laughs> And so I says, let's play a game. And if you've ever had kids, you know, you play all kinds of games with your kids. Well, this one's I spy. Now, I spy with my little eye. Well, I wanted to spy and see who can call out being competitive. The most number of battleships in my wife was going to be, a okay, mom was going to be the judge is who could see the most. Not fair, right? But hey, he has eyes. I have eyes. We're going to have a competition. And, you know, dad was going to show how good he was at seeing all these numbers. And the battleships have numbers that are, 10 to 12 feet high. They're in white. They're on gray battleships, pretty easy to see, often by the anchor or someplace else. So I started rattling off all these numbers. I said, are you ready? Is that go? And I went, rrr, rrr, with all these numbers. And he says, mom, dad's pulling my leg. And I, now I'm figuring he's pulling my leg. He said, there's no numbers on those battleships. Hmm. There's no numbers on those battleships. So Kathy, ask, him, ask Nick if he's being serious. And Nick said, I'm being serious. I don't see him. It's okay. I'm going to hold my glasses in front of you and I'm going, don't touch them, please. I don't want them in the harbor. Do you see anything now as I go to and fro your eyes towards the front of that battleship? He says, yeah, there's a number there. And I says, you didn't see that number before? He says, no. And once again, pointing to what? Often we don't know what we're missing or how crummy crummy is or how well we can be. And so I asked him, well, when we go to movies, so, you know, this was Disney era for him, you know, and we usually like to sit in the back of the theater. I says, so, are they crisp? If, if this is on the harbor tour, right? The battleships are not going by, right? But, <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're talking about vision. And he says, no, they're all kind of grainy and, you know, fuzzy, but isn't that how all movies are? So I encourage your patients and the patients out there listening to really ask, how good is good? And have I reached that level of truly thriving versus merely surviving? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that's absolutely a key component because, yeah, I'll get a lot of – of kickback when there's a lot of miles, but yeah, just like you're explaining, it, it's something that you got to take a closer look. You got to pay attention. I'm a huge proponent of food journals and yep. making notes. What about you? Oh, for sure. In fact, I go one step further. I would say list the five things that you would like to see different that are measurable in your life when it comes to health. Maybe it's your bowels, maybe it's headaches, maybe it's aches and pains, whatever it might be. So I says, now let's go ahead and do the food thing, avoid the foods, and let's go ahead and analytically, I said, write it down someplace, and I'm going to write it down too, and then let's go ahead in a month or three weeks, let's sit down and see how those numbers move. And when you ask a patient if they have, when they don't do this, how, how are you feeling better? No, I don't feel any better. Then, but you have the list. You pull, pull out the list. Like So how, how's your headaches? Well, now that you mention, I've only had one headache in the last four weeks. I usually have two or three per week. So how's your bowels? Are they still kind of crampy and bloated? Well, now that you mentioned my bowels are actually better than I thought. And my significant other actually mentioned I'm more acceptable to be around. Like, okay, so you are making some progress. But being analytical and objective, journaling it is really important because we get so busy, we just take things for granted. And we're like, and it's like well, I felt better. And if we can reproduce those better days and you stack them, then you have interest bearing account in your health savings account. Because you're no longer allocating resources to fighting off debt and burden. And now you're, much like Benjamin Franklin, a penny saved is a penny earned. <laughs> and now you've got dividend-bearing account. It's huge. That is huge. Let's, let's talk about those dividend-bearing accounts if we don't invest in them for a minute. So say someone looks at their food sensitivity testing and they're like, ah, oh, this is a bunch of hogwash. I'm not even going to deal with it. I can't deal with it right now. And that's okay, you know, like like you said, we meet patients where they're at, but say someone is just kind of like, just 
I don't want to deal with that. I don't think that this testing is, is real. I don't think it's legit. What would you say to someone in terms of long-term effects of chronic food sensitivities on the body if they're not addressed? I, two things. It contributes to inflammation. And inflammation is something that's very pervasive in the medical literature. And once again, you can Google it or you can PubMed <laughs> it. And it's called inflam aging. Inflammation ages the body. Inflammation accelerates the risk for heart disease. It accelerates the risk for Alzheimer's and joint destruction and onwards. The other thing is if there's a food that your immune system, the scanner at the source, ever so vigilant for, much like the eye in the sky at a casino in Vegas, as we were talking about, it's like, okay, the security camera's looking for suspicious activity. Well, if your immune system's distracted by eggs and eggs continue to trigger it, then the security guards, okay, your immune system is distracted, and then mischievous things can occur while the security guard is distracted. You never want to have your immune system unduly distracted or burdened, and the more inflammation you have, the more likely you are to have degeneration in your body. And so that's kind of my approach to why do we eat foods which we eat. Now, I will tell you, I know what my food sensitivities are, and when I travel, it's much harder to do your food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. But in the buffet of life, I'm consciously making a choice. And now it's an informed choice. So knowing is better than not knowing. Now, if you decide to ignore it, so be it. But also now you're feeling crummy. Well, then I'm saying I'm going to pay attention to my food sensitivities. When enough cells in my body, you're made of trillions of cells. Each of us are made of trillions of cells. So I gave an example in front of about three or 400 doctors in New York. I asked, I said, I'm going to tell you lots of things I know, but I want you folks, these are New York East Coast doctors, pretty <laughs> serious group. I said, but I wanted to have you folks tell me how many cells in my body are tired right now? Because I can tell you before this hour and a half long lecture, I'm pretty tired. I flew in at 11 o'clock, your guys' time, and now it's 7 o'clock, your guys' time, which is 4 o'clock my time. I'm getting a little tired, but I got enough energy for you, so don't worry about that. So I said, how many cells in my body are tired? Can anybody know? Because I don't know. Quiet. I'm saying, no, I'm serious. I'm asking you, how many cells in my body have to be tired before I realize I'm tired? No answer. I said, I didn't have an answer either, and I still don't have an answer. But I said, let's make it simpler. How many cells in my index finger have to hurt if I have a splinter in it before I realize my finger hurts? And still no answer. So then the question is, how many cells in your body have to be perturbed by a food, aka incredibly unhappy, whether it be in your GI tract, um, enough to actually have changed how you feel mood-wise, um, give you a headache. We're talking about, at the very least, probably billions of cells which are now disturbed. It's like someone with a chalkboard phenomena, scratching their things, or that person that has a really loud ringer on their phone. Well, your body is now being constantly irritated. And I can tell you, just living with in the human race and the news feeds and the pollution, there's enough burdens in the body to think that you can consciously or subconsciously or with intention not eat or not eat a food, which is further adding that burden, that proverbial straw on the camel's back. Yeah, it's like, at least you know. And I, sometimes I'm naughty. Um, my birthday was um, on Wednesday, and I was naughty. I actually had carrot cake with some cream cheese. I'm, I love the cream cheese more than the carrot cake. And, <laughs> but I don't do dairy really well. And I'm paying for it. I'm paying for it. I knew it consciously. Now I know I'm going to be really good for a while. <laughs> and that's ultimately, yeah, what ends up happening. You, you just got to make that choice. Like, all right, you know, do I go for it? And I know what the consequences are. And, you know, if it's worth it, then shoot, do it. There's some carrot cakes with cream cheese frosting that I'd do it for <laughs> over and over again. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Just to have it. And that's that's the choice you make which is, you know, something that I think is a beautiful thing because at least you have the knowledge when you've done some food sensitivity testing to know what's the problem and what's not. Yep. And, but you all will be proud of me. There's carrot cake sitting on the counter. I have not touched it again. I had my piece of carrot cake <laughs> and because I just have too many things to do right now that I can't be fuzzy in my brain or have my ear hurt because we were talking early on about Meniere's disease and um, sensitivities and, well, I know that if I do too much dairy, I'll get an ice pick to my ear. It feels like someone has literally put it through my ear canal into my ear drum. 
Oh, and so it's like, okay, that's how many cells in my body and how much is my nerves saying and what is my brain thinking and why did I do too much dairy? Okay. A little dairy, a little have to live life. I'm not telling anybody to, you know, stop living life, but you know, I don't know, once again you kinda of want to find a balance point. It's that's all about moderation in life. Absolutely. You just weigh it out and, and act accordingly. So I have one more question left before we sum up because this has been a great conversation and I definitely have other things that I know that you're interested in that I want to geek out on you on future podcasts. But today we're going to keep it to the food sensitivity testing. And my last question, which I get a lot from patients about retesting food sensitivities. And I even get emails from US Biotech as to when I should retest someone's food sensitivities. What is your opinion? You do the food sensitivity test, the people get on their plan, they go through the whole year. Would you say that waiting a year is a good time? Would you say that waiting six months is a good time to retest? What is your opinion on retesting to see what's going on? It depends on, and it's really individual, and that's where us as clinicians help mm -hmm. the patient. The patient helps us by telling us about how well they've made their symptom improvements. But what I would say is if a person's had been on antibiotics and we're working on a leaky gut syndrome or they have leaky gut for another reason, it's going to take me as a better part of three to six months to get the GI tract a little happier. And leaky gut is, if you think of a colander, which where you might strain your noodles or your lightly steamed vegetables that we were talking earlier, if they had too large holes, your broccoli is going to go down the drain. So mm -hmm. what we want to do is make sure that the tight junctions of our GI tract are actually tight and they're serving their purpose and not allowing a larger amount of molecule to go through because the last thing you want to do if you have dairy is have your immune system all of a sudden here resounding in only the language of the immune system. <laughs> if, you, if your immune system hears a cow, too much cow has gotten through your gut. <laughs> and so we, so you know, if a person's been on antibiotics and they have a, a dysbiosis, which, which means imbalanced bacteria, it's going to take a little longer. If a person really, they have that severe sensitivities, you've cleaned it up a little bit, you've worked on the microbiome, and then all of a sudden it's much easier to say, well, we'll measure you sooner. Then we have to say, well, why are we measuring you? Are you going to reintroduce the foods that if, if you overdo them will cause problems again? Or are you always going to be watchful of them? So it depends, but sometimes there's so many food sensitivities that we really need to do a test sooner than later to see, okay, which of these were earned and which are fixed? and how quickly can we maybe tease them back in a little bit? Because ultimately it comes down to nutritional status. You can have a condition called orthorexia where you're so hyperly aware of your foods that you're actually doing greater harm to yourself in the attempt to do better for yourself. You actually end up being so fixated and paranoid that you actually end up becoming malnourished. Yes. And that is a good point to bring up because it is something that I actually spoke out quite uh, candidly about myself and creating a food and eating disorder in myself um, because of extensive food sensitivity testing. And so it's a real deal. It really can happen. So I think. Oh, it's yeah, very, very much so. So it's just like with anorexia or bulimia, orthorexia, because we now know so much and we can get so much feed. This is where they say, and I can't tell me if I get the saying wrong. The physician who has himself as a patient has a patient as a fool. <laughs> and it goes something like that because yeah. we, if I, I lose my objectivity the moment I start treating myself. Mm -hmm. And so obviously as lay people as well, if you start treating yourself, A, you may not have the full medical science background. Plus you, you're myoptic about, okay, you're focused on this one thing when there's actually landmines all around you and you're focused on the mosquito. But actually a mosquito is a risk but the landmines around you are a greater risk in terms of instant problems. And this is what we do as healthcare providers, help tease out, well, let's focus and agree upon a menu. And your and my style of practice is very similar. It's we work collaboratively and empower our patients and work towards thriving and not merely surviving. Absolutely. I couldn't have said that better. So Dr. Chris, I know after listening to this, a lot of folks are going to be like, oh, Dr. Chris, where's he at? Where does he practice out of? Where can I find him? Tell our folks where they can find you. Tell us a little bit about your website because you have some really good resources on it and let the folks know where to find you. Well, certainly. So 
My website is either Dr. Miletus, M E L E T I S, and also you can get to it by typing in Divine Medicine, D I V I N E Medicine dot com, and you'll see several of my books and articles and all this. But um, I actually am in Beaverton, Oregon. I'm right by the Nike campus, and most of my life these days is lecturing, writing. Um, I have a book coming out on the mitochondria that just came out or will be coming out in about two weeks. And it's all about how our little double A batteries either fuel our body properly or don't. And much like the Energizer Bunny, we're all expected to show up the next day and keep on going. And life's more daunting than it was a generation or two ago. And so I wrote that book. So I'm busy doing things. So I practice a little bit and I mentor people a lot. And I just love doing what I'm doing um, after 27 years of clinical practices. Some practice, some educating, some writing, some lecturing, and sharing. Because we're a team of human. And we need mm-hmm. to bring the humanity back into the human race. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge. We are definitely going to have you back to talk all about your book and all about those mitochondria and CoQ10. So folks who are listening, stay tuned. There's going to be another follow-up podcast where we're going to be geeking out on your mitochondria and CoQ10. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Wow, that was a lot of info. What did you think of all that? As always, I'm wanting to inspire you to take charge of your health. The takeaway from today's podcast is to consider that you might need a few things to restart your health or to even boost it. I technically do a detox quarterly, but some of the things here in Sarah's protocol can be used daily. I encourage you to start your health journey by drinking at least one eight ounce glass of water each morning when you wake up before you do anything else. Of course, go to the bathroom first. But essentially, your body has been repairing and restoring you overnight, and it's used a lot of water to do this. So start your day off by rehydrating yourself versus dehydrating yourself with that cup of coffee. Now, I'm not saying don't drink your coffee before you freak out. You can always have your coffee, just drink some water before it. By being hydrated, you're actually going to start your day much better, and you'll be better prepared to detox all day long. So if you're drinking water regularly each morning, you're going to prime yourself for doing a gentle detox, such as Sarah's Accelerated Detox, and you'll see results faster. So if you like this podcast, please share it with one person you know that could use a little boost in their health. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so more people can find out about the health fix. I hope you have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.